And the overview of the autonomic nervous system, you're actually going to check out how the ANS is set up, and very much so, focus on the synapses. In a nutshell, the efferent arm of ANS is where a number of drugs will have their effects. There will be two synapses for us to review, the cholinergic and the adrenergic synapse. In chapter 3, we are simply going to look at the overall setup, and there is a huge emphasis on our exam. The emphasis is cardiovascular, particularly blood pressure control mechanism. So please, you pay good attention to stories such as baroreceptor reflexes, and you start thinking very theoretically without any names of drugs in this chapter. What would happen if this drug would bind to a cholinergic synapse? What would happen if it was binding to specifically muscarinic or alpha or beta receptors? And look well at the dual innovation of organs and system in the body, because it will give you a key concept of pharmacology, which is with ANS, if there's a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic, we can very quickly understand that to get a sympathetic response, we could either stimulate sympathetic or block parasympathetic, vice versa. If I wanted more of a parasympathetic pharmacology, I could either stimulate the parasympathetic receptors or system, and otherwise I could block the sympathetic nervous system. It is also in this chapter that we'll be introduced to the classic zigzag tracings of blood pressure and heart rate. And finally, in the last portion of that chapter, so that we don't feel like all it is ANS is a story about cardiovascular, because we really would be misled if we were thinking this way. We are, of course, going to focus on the eye, particularly on pupil regulation, so the pupil light reflex, if you want, and uh, obviously also accommodation. You know that when it comes to looking at a patient's pupils, it can give us a very important clue, particularly when it comes to drugs of abuse, and therefore to emergency room settings. The autonomic nervous system is importantly involved with the regulation of vegetative function. Vegetative function are all these responses that don't require our conscious control. We know from both anatomy and physiology, the structure and the actual responses associated with autonomic innovation. There are three subdivisions to the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic are the ones we'll primarily try and affect with drugs. But let's not forget that the enteric nervous system, in and of itself, is an integral portion of our autonomic control of visceral function. As you look at the enteric subdivision, it comprises two interconnected plexus in anatomy, the myenteric plexus of Albach and the submucosal plexus of Messner. They're in the gut wall, they're entirely outside of the CNS, so part of the peripheral nervous system, and pretty much so, the coordination of the motility of that gut is going to be modulated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic. So this said, our major story will be for us to describe sympathetic and parasympathetic and their effectors. As I look at the efferent arm of the autonomic nervous system, this is the portion that is best characterized. And for the ANS, it's always encompassing two neurons. The first neuron is referred to as the preganglionic neuron. It's cell body is in the CNS, it tends to be thinly myelinated, and invariably, whether you're in sympathetic or parasympathetic, it contains acetylcholine. The postganglionic neuron is the second neuron of the efferent pathway. Its cell body is in the periphery. It's in the peripheral ganglion. It is unmyelinated, and here's where we see a classic neurochemistry difference. Whereas parasympathetic postganglionic neurons contain acetylcholine, sympathetic postganglionic neurons contain norepinephrine. In the diagram, we show you accurately the origin of the preganglionic nerve for parasympathetic on the left, sympathetic on the right. You know that parasympathetic neurons arise from two broad areas, the brainstem with cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10, and the sacral spine, S2 to S4, giving out the pelvic splenix. Sympathetic, on the other hand, arises from thoracolumbar segments from T1 to L2, giving rise to this intermediate lateral column of gray matter, which is easily distinguished so that you can actually identify the location of your spinal cord slice on an anatomy question. These thoracolumbar segments give rise to two types of splanchnic nerves, the thoracic splanchnic, T5 to T12, primarily for the upper portion of the body, and the lumbar splanchnic, arising from L1 to L2. So if I represent this with the table below, I can see that in parasympathetic, two points of origin, cranial nerve nuclei for 3, 7, 9, and 10, and sacral segment S2 to S4, give rise to a preganglionic neuron that contains acetylcholine. This acetylcholine, released at the level of an autonomic ganglia, which is close to the tissue that is innervated by parasympathetic, in essence, preganglionic nerve terminal of parasympathetic are pretty long, well, these ganglia have nicotinic neuronal type of receptors, hence the N subscript N, N for nicotinic neuronal. That acetylcholine stimulates the nicotinic neuronal receptors and activates the postganglionic nerve terminal. The postganglionic nerve, in turn, releases again acetylcholine at the effector cell. Now, here, the only key difference is acetylcholine no longer work on an NN receptor. That was in a ganglion. It works now on a muscarinic type of receptor. These muscarinic receptors are scattered on every tissue that has a parasympathetic innervation. Smooth muscle, particularly of the bronchioles and the eye and the gut and the GU tract. Certainly there will be muscarinic receptors in the heart on every exocrine gland, so all this will represent ultimately our pharmacology of our drugs. Contrast, if I look at sympathetic arising from T1 to L2, I see well a preganglionic neuron that still releases acetylcholine, still binds to a nicotinic neuronal receptor of a sympathetic ganglion. These ganglia tend to be very close to the spinal cord, so preganglionic nerve terminals from sympathetic are very short. It's the postganglionic neuron that is longer, and a key difference, the release of norepinephrine in the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. Norepi does not work on muscarinic or nicotinic receptor. It has its own subtype of receptors, clearly alpha or beta receptors. Whereas norepi will have access to two types of alpha, alpha 1 and alpha 2, norepi will only have access to one type of beta receptors, the beta 1 receptor. Classically, sympathetic responses will oppose parasympathetic responses. That's why you see that the effector cells comprise, again, smooth muscle and various tissue, heart and glands overall. Talking about glands, there is a specific exception with sympathetic nervous system and its chemistry when it comes to eccrine sweat glands. Eccrine sweat glands are turned on by stress, maybe stress from excessive heat, but maybe emotional stress, where you start sweating the palms of your hands, get wet, your lower back, maybe your forehead. And those sweat glands actually are innervated by sympathetic.
anesthetic, but are activated by acetylcholine being released and stimulating muscarinic receptors. That's why sometimes for sweat glands, we talk of sympathetic cholinergic innovation. Now, here's what it means to me in pharmacology. If I stop at this level of ANS right now, I see that then there is two ways of working on parasympathetic or sympathetic responses. If I wanted a parasympathetic response, it would seem pretty logical to stimulate the actual muscarinic receptors or the release of acetylcholine. But because of dual innovation, most tissues receiving branches of sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Well, another way of achieving that same parasympathetic effect is quite likely to block the sympathetic. And by blocking sympathetic, I mean either interfering with norepinephrine levels or interfering with the alpha or beta receptors. Realize then that for once, giving an antagonist, although the antagonist has no effect of its own, it doesn't activate any single transduction, I will see a change in the physiology of my patient simply because blocking sympathetic would unmask the parasympathetic on this tissue. Look, conversely, if I wanted a sympathetic response to predominate in the patient, as I remove my painting there, you know there's two ways of getting sympathetic responses too. Either I directly stimulate alpha or beta receptors or try and increase levels of norepinephrine in the synapse, or, and, I could just as well block muscarinic receptors or acetylcholine release from parasympathetic. So if there is dual innovation, blocking one system will allow the other one to predominate. And you know, because blockers have very little efficacy, if at all, then they are favored in medicine. You are less likely to see side effects and intolerance to a drug with an antagonist, whereas when you give agonists, there are always responses. Agonists have efficacy. That's why, in essence, medicine uses blockers much more than it uses agonists, unless it really wants an effect, where, of course, the agonist will give it to you. So where do these muscarinic receptors stand? Well, when it comes to sweating, when it comes to glands, notice then that when you block a muscarinic receptor, you will wipe out all gland secretion. And I like to look at secretion as a parameter in pharmacology because essentially it's a good sign that the drug may or may not have a muscarinic pharmacology. If you see increased secretion, it must be stimulating muscarinic receptors. If you see decreased secretion, it must be blocking it. And uh, seeing no sweat and therefore an increased body heat becomes a hallmark feature of anti-muscarinic drugs. Now, that's the classic autonomic nervous system with its two innovation. We would not be complete if we weren't bringing about the neuroendocrine system. TA2L1 releases acetylcholine at the level of the adrenal medulla. And these preganglionic neurons are exactly the, the, like the preganglionic sympathetic neurons. The key difference is at the level of the adrenal medulla. When the nicotinic receptors are stimulated by acetylcholine, there is no postganglionic nerve terminal to release norepinephrine at the effector cell level. What the adrenal medulla's chromaffin cells do is degranulate and release a hormone called epinephrine. Now, you heard this well. I use the word hormone for epinephrine. Norepinephrine and acetylcholine are neurotransmitters. They're released in synapses. Epinephrine is a hormone. It's released in the bloodstream. Key relevance of this, wherever the blood takes epinephrine, epinephrine will go. And receptors do not require innovation to be bound to by epinephrine. You don't need to have a synapse for epinephrine to work. Epinephrine is in your blood just like a drug would be. It does mean that certain receptors that have no synapses, that have no innovation, may never be accessible to norepi, but maybe to epi. And what's the receptor I'm trying to describe to you desperately here? It's the beta-2 receptor. Beta-2 receptors will be unique to epinephrine's pharmacology. They're not innovating, so only epinephrine can reach it. And even if I was giving norepi, because the structure is slightly different, norepi still would not bind to a beta-2 receptor. So as we review pharmacology of these important neurotransmitter and hormones, you already know that whereas norepi binds to alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1, epinephrine can also bind alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1, but epinephrine will be different in that it also binds to beta-2. Beta-2 is going to be important for metabolic effects of that hormone. After all, epinephrine is a stress hormone and also quite relevant in the lungs and the vessels. Final aspect of talking about neurotransmission in this chapter. Well, I think you know as well as I do that acetylcholine and norepi are certainly not only autonomic nervous system type of neurotransmitters. For one, we have norepi and acetylcholine in our brain. So there is CNS effect of norepi and acetylcholine. Now, if that's not part of ANS, it could still be part of the effect of a drug, since if they cross the blood-brain barrier, they could find receptors to acetylcholine and norepinephrine. That means we might see CNS side effects, toxicity, indication to drugs that work on these receptors. But what is shown here is also another peripheral role to acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter in physiology responsible for skeletal muscle to eventually undergo contraction. We remind you here that coming from the motor cortex, the upper motor neuron, eventually synapses with lower motor neurons in the anterior horn of our spinal cord. Lower motor neurons in turn are acetylcholine containing neurons, whereby acetylcholine is released at the neuromuscular junction and stimulates a nicotinic receptor. What I want you to pay attention to in this figure is the nicotinic receptor in question is an NM type of receptor, not N. So this is not a neuronal type of nicotinic receptor. It's a muscular type of nicotinic receptor. Essentially, acetylcholine here depolarizes the muscle, causing an N plate synaptic potential or EPSP. And as EPSPs summate, they allow the membrane potential to reach threshold potential, after which the action potential is generated to be accompanied with mechanical contraction. So... In this section, we're going to deal with drugs that work on acetylcholine and its receptors, on norepinephrine and their receptors. And quite relevantly, whereas epinephrine is a hormone, the other uh, neurotransmitters released in synapses. We will do a few words about dopamine, if anything, as a precursor of norepi, but also because dopamine does have some peripheral role, particularly vasodilating, renal and mesenteric vascular beds. Before we embark looking at drugs, let's look at general mechanisms or general responses that are controlled by ANS. One big aspect of ANS will be to actually prepare us for the cardiovascular section. And as I'm looking at the cardiovascular section, I know that one big disease that we'll try and control is that of hypertension. Hypotension, on the other hand, would be a big emergent situation in issues of shock. Well, ANS, as well as the endocrine system, monitor and control blood pressure. And with neural responses, reflexes mediated by the ANS may very well try and correct sudden changes in blood pressure.
Now, for a discussion that would parallel the one we're about to have, you would want to go and look at your physiology of ANS regulation of blood pressure, as indicated in your margin. But here's what it boils down to. First, before we focus on the figure, let's focus on the important concept on the right. In this important concept, we see the classic hemodynamics of blood pressure. Mean arterial blood pressure is very much controlled by the cardiac output, which is, its, which is itself the product of heart rate times stroke volume. And of course, the main parameter of blood pressure, which is total or systemic vascular resistance. That total peripheral resistance is very much in turn controlled by the parameter of radius of a vessel. If you remember, resistance is inversely related to that radius with a narrow vessel offering greater resistance, whereas a large vessel with a large radius having less resistance. The relevance of this parameter is tremendously magnified to the extent that the radius to the fourth power is inversely related to that resistance. So any change in radius would dramatically change TPR. Any change in TPR would in turn dramatically change blood pressure. That is why in pharmacology, when we want to work appropriately on blood pressure, by far we'll choose drugs that work on altering the radius of a vessel. This said, Let's look at nervous reflexes in the control of blood pressure. The whole idea is both sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nervous system will acutely control blood pressure changes through baroreceptor-mediated reflexes. The idea is anytime blood pressure drops, the reflex will try and raise back the blood pressure. Anytime blood pressure increases, the reflex will try and drop that blood pressure. Who's responsible for these changes? Well, any decrease in blood pressure should result in sympathetic autonomic nervous system firing to raise it back. Any increase in blood pressure should result in primary parasympathetic nervous system firing so that we would drop back the blood pressure. The individual parameters that are controlled by ANS are going to be the heart rate itself, the contractility and therefore the stroke volume. You know that the product of heart rate and stroke volume would be the cardiac output. And then very importantly, the total peripheral resistance, particularly by altering the diameter, altering the radius of that vessel. As I look at the figure, it is representing then for me the location of these receptors that sense the pressure. These receptors sense the stretch of the vessel are located in the aortic arch and in the carotid sinuses. Those of the aortic arch are innervated by nerve 10, those of the carotid sinuses by nerve 9. They send the information about the blood pressure status to brainstem cardiovascular centers from where outflows parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. Whereas parasympathetic primarily focuses on the heart rate. Sympathetic has a far-fetched effect on heart rate contractility, arteriolar resistance, and venous resistance. And you know that whereas arteriolar resistance represents TPR, venal constriction increases preload by increasing venous return to the heart, and therefore in turn, with more stretching, greater contractility would raise CO. So three parameters for cardiac output, heart rate, direct effect on the ventricular muscle with contractility, what we call inotropy, and venal constriction, one big effect on TPR, which is arteriolar smooth muscle with sympathetic innervation. What are the actual dissected responses all about? What's the chemistry, the receptors of the baroreceptor reflex? Well, you see this in figure 3 to one b at the bottom of your page. First, understand well that baroreceptors sensing stretch. They fire when blood pressure is increased in physiology. So at the top of your diagram, let's start with a trigger where blood pressure is increased. That stimulation of baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and aortic arch will be sending the information to the CNS saying, hey, your blood pressure is too high. Do something to lower it. So to lower it, what will happen? Well, there will be increased parasympathetic outflow and decreased sympathetic outflow. The increased parasympathetic will involve acetylcholine being released at the ganglionic level, stimulating a nicotinic neuronal receptor. In turn, a post-ganglionic parasympathetic nerve will release acetylcholine once again, but this time stimulate the muscarinic M2 receptor, which is found on SA and AV node of the heart and will cause significant bradycardia. What it means then is that any switch of blood pressure from a normal level to a higher level should be associated with a reflex bradycardia. That reflex bradycardia is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And if I were to pause right here and ask you, how could I prevent that reflex bradycardia, which is a type of arrhythmia? I mean, we all realize in medicine, bradycardia could be at its worst an AV block. And an AV block will cause massive hassle in controlling ventricular rhythm with the hemodynamics. It could be fatal. So what am I going to do if I didn't want the reflex bradycardia? You just understood the mechanism of it. Block it for me. You see that in theory, there are two ways of blocking that reflex bradycardia. One would be very non-selectively to block nicotinic neuronal receptors in ganglia. Then as you block neuronal receptors in ganglia, very little doubt, you have no more parasympathetic outflow. You cannot have a reflex bradycardia. A way that would be a little bit more precise would be to block the muscarinic M2 receptors themselves with anti-muscarinic drugs. Telling you there are two ways of dealing with reflex bradycardias. So, certainly in theory, blocking the ganglionic synapse with nicotinic antagonists or blocking the effector cell synapse with muscarinic antagonists. Notice that in all instances, providing the change in blood pressure was not mediated by these receptors. Then you would just selectively cancel the reflex bradycardia with these drugs while letting another drug raise the blood pressure may be in a shocky patient. Of course, in turn, what we're not looking at in this diagram is the absence of sympathetic. But I know from the previous figure that the decreased sympathetic means less contractility of the ventricles and cardiac output, less veno and arteriolar constriction to further lower the blood pressure. Look at the converse now in this diagram and bottom portion showing you a decreased blood pressure as a trigger. When there is a drop in blood pressure, baroreceptors are silent. They're inhibited. Silence is noise to our brain. If there is no sound from baroreceptors, this is understood by cardiovascular centers of the brainstem, of the pons in particular, that the blood pressure is dangerously low. If it is dangerously low this time, what we're going to try and favor is an increased sympathetic activity versus a decreased parasympathetic. Now to have that increased sympathetic, I will first have to stimulate the preganglionic nerve to release acetylcholine and nicotinic neuronal receptors. Stimulation of these receptors in turn will stimulate the postganglionic nerve of sympathetic to release norepinephrine. And norepinephrine will bind to alpha-1 receptors to vasoconstrict raise TPR in blood pressure, a beta-1 receptor to cause a reflex tachycardia. 
Now, reflex tachycardias are also an arrhythmia. If your heart starts beating too fast, you don't have time to fill. If you have a significant ventricular tachycardia, your cardiac output could be compromised and you're going to drop dead. This is further of importance when you think that gazillion people out there are receiving drugs to lower their blood pressure because they have hypertensive disease. And what physiology is showing me here with the ANS is, as I'm trying to lower my patient's high blood pressure that they've adapted to, their body is imposing a baroreceptor reflex tachycardia to try and prevent the effect of my drug number one, and to try, number two, to increase heart work and raise back the blood pressure. Now, you heard this, increase heart work. What is hypertension a major risk for? I know excitedly you're telling me ischemia and heart disease with angina, potential for MI. If I'm asking my heart to work more because I have an antihypertensive that's dropping my blood pressure, I'm also asking this patient to be more likely to develop angina and potentially an MI. Now, between you and I, once you've died of an MI, clearly you don't need an antihypertensive anymore, but that may not be the best approach, is it? So how would I block the reflex tachycardia? You see it well on this diagram. Two ways. One possibility would be, let's block the effect of acetylcholine and nicotinic neuronal receptors. So now it turns out, ganglionic blockade would wipe out reflex bradycardias due to hypertension or reflex tachycardias due to hypotension. Really, if I block ganglia, I'm wiping out all ANS responses, whether they're mediated by sympathetic or parasympathetic. So we can expect this to be a theoretical site of action of a drug, but very unlikely used in practice from the standpoint that it would cause tremendous side effect. Far more specifically, we could use a beta blocker, we could use an alpha blocker, and those would cancel the effect on blood pressure from the sympathetic reflex. Now, more specifically for the reflex tachycardia, a beta-1 antagonist will remove that reflex tachycardia. So I want you to take this home with you as a message. To remove reflex bradycardia, anti-muscarinic drugs can be used. To remove reflex tachycardia, beta-1 blockers can be used. In either situation, in theory, a ganglionic blocker would wipe out all baroreceptor reflex changes in heart rate. It would be unfair to only think that blood pressure is controlled at the ANS level. It is clear that one function of the endocrine system is also that of homeostasis in our body. An endocrine control of blood pressure does involve a famous target of drug, which is the renin androtensin aldosterone system. Well, this one works primarily in settings where there is a decreased mean blood pressure. Really, if I wanted to be physiologically correct, any situation where there is decreased renal blood flow, including locally at the level of the kidney, such as in renal artery stenosis or such as in uh, nephritis, well, any decreased renal blood flow, any decreased GFR is going to result in the production of renin. Renin is an enzyme that will promote formation of angiotensin 2 from angiotensinogen first and then angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 with ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. So renin is just the beginning of a pathway. We'll talk more about this pathway in the cardiovascular section. Needless to say that the primary role of angiotensin 2 is twofold increase aldosterone release from the adrenal cortex to cause salt and water retention, increasing blood volume, which in turn increases blood pressure. And quite importantly, angiotensin 2 also causes vasoconstriction resulting in increased DPR. So now I'm facing a dilemma with my antihypertensive drugs, whereby with lowering of blood pressure, I expect both ANS and endocrine system to be triggered. And as they're both triggered, I expect the effect of my antihypertensive drug to wane away, to be really removed by the physiology of our control of blood pressure. For instance, lowering blood pressure will cause reflex tachycardia. That's going to be due to the increased sympathetic autonomic nervous system activity, as we saw, norepinephrine on beta 1, but also significant salt and water retention, which will come from the increase in aldosterone. So from the increased plasma renin activity, if you want. That is the primary reason why you'll see most antihypertensive managements to involve, at the very least, a beta blocker, a beta blocker cancelling the tachycardia, and quite often, diuretics to promote salt and water losses. These drugs are not necessarily added to lower blood pressure. They're primarily added in order to prevent the modulating effect of ANS and endocrine. So here's an example. What would you tell me drug X is doing on this diagram? First, drug X is administered at the tip of this arrow. So if it's administered at the tip of this arrow right here, it means before drug X is what you would call the baseline. And after drug X is what's on the right of the figure. Now, after drug X, I see mean blood pressure. The tracing went up. So I'm going to say mean blood pressure went up. And as I'm looking at the spacing between two systolic or diastolic, I'm seeing that as the blood pressure go up, I'm seeing a broader and broader space between systolics until so eventually my blood pressure even starts going back downwards, which could either be drug X's effect is going away or could be a result from that bradycardia. Is that bradycardia due to the drug or reflex? I would be tempted to say reflex right now, but you know, don't jump too quickly to conclusion. There are drugs out there that could raise blood pressure and yet lower the heart rate. So it's something that we'll have to answer independently. But what I'm hoping this page will do to us is make sure that we can at least analyze what a drug does to blood pressure and heart rate when we look at these tracings. This chapter gave us all the required luggage to move on to important sections of ANS, where we'll first look at cholinergic pharmacology and then look at adrenergic pharmacology. In any case, don't get lost with ANS. It's very systematic as an approach, as you've seen. If you know where a drug is working, pre- or post-synaptic, pre- or post-ganglionic, you should be able to already have an idea through your ANS understanding of what the responses should be. It would be wrong to imagine that all of ANS is going to boil down to blood pressure changes and heart rate changes. Although this said, it is by far the most relevant aspect of ANS and the potential for drugs and indications. You know, one aspect of ANS that will come and plague us on board question, but really help us, particularly in emergency room, will be to look at the effect of drugs on pupil size, at the effect of drugs on the process of accommodation, which is the focusing for near vision to see clear what's right next to your nose. Now, this involves non-conscious control that is very much through parasympathetic and sympathetic innovation of the iris muscles. 
and for accommodation, parasympathetic innervation of what we call the ciliary muscle. So let's work on them separately. And let's keep in mind what we're going to try and understand here. What we're going to try and understand is if I see a dilated or a constricted pupil, can I actually guess what the drug mechanism is? In which case, could I come up with the class of drug or the potential member of, of that class that would be responsible for that response? Well, this is going to be particularly well done if we also look at effects on accommodation. So first, let's work with the pupil. In the figure, you see a beautiful brown iris. And this brown iris is really made of two types of muscles. Bottom left, you see circular muscles, circular muscles or sphincters. Top right, you see muscles arranged in the iris like the spokes of a wheel. These are radial muscles. What will happen to the actual pupil size if I constrict these muscles? Well, a sphincter muscle, being what it is, you constrict a circular muscle, squeak, you're going to end up with a smaller pupil. So constriction of sphincter muscle will always result in meiosis. You contrast constriction of a radial muscle, like the spokes of a wheel. Constriction of a radial muscle will result in dilation of a pupil. So constriction of a radial muscle will always result in medriasis. All I need to figure out is which branch of ANS should be responsible for this. It's probably one of the easy response to tag to sympathetic. Sympathetic is in flight, fright, fight. Think of those cartoons and those characters where the eyes literally pop out of their head when they're surprised by something. Well, in sympathetic stimulation, I need to open that pupil so that maximum light stimulation occurs of my retina to improve the vision of possibly something that is threatening or something I must react to emergently. That means sympathetic must cause medriasis. To cause medriasis, I must constrict a radial muscle. A radial muscle is a smooth muscle. So I'm going to choose an alpha-1 receptor because I remember from the previous chapter that alpha-1 receptor is a GQ couple and therefore increase calcium in that muscle. And indeed, alpha-1 stimulation of the radial muscle of the iris will always result in medriasis. So alpha-1 agonist would be associated with medriasis. Because there's dual innervation, a muscarinic blocker will also cause medriasis. You contrast it. Dilated pupil are easily associated with sympathetic response is. Then I would be left to guess that parasympathetic responses must be the one responsible for meiosis. To have meiosis, then, will be the classic issue with all muscarinic agonists. As usual, when there's dual innovation, if muscarinic agonist causes meiosis, so will an alpha blocker, since an alpha blocker would leave muscarinic predominant. Essentially, it tells you this about pupils. When I look at changes in pupil size, I can narrow it down to two broad mechanisms for the drug to result in that pupil change. Whereas muscarinic agonists and alpha blockers cause meiosis, alpha-1 agonists and muscarinic antagonists cause medriasis. Could I refine this and come up to an actual answer as to which of these two groups is responsible for the pupil size change? The answer is yes, providing my patient can describe to me whether they have blurred vision or not. Having a blurry vision is a hallmark feature of not being able to accommodate. This figure, 330B, is showing you the ciliary muscle. Now, the ciliary muscle is not part of the iris. The ciliary muscle is actually, thanks to suspensory ligament, holding the lens in place. The lens is like a blob of jello that's an important diffraction medium for vision. Now, if the lens is very nice and flat, just like the panel of a window, it means you see clear through it to infinity. So a flat lens to the left of the diagram is classic of normal vision, where you see your environment clearly in the distance. If you need to focus, you need to have a spasm of accommodation. And focusing for near vision will require constriction of the ciliary muscle. Constriction of the ciliary muscle is going to slacken the suspensory ligament, allowing the lens to become more spherical. And as it becomes more spherical, the light is going to be distorted by the spherical lens, a little bit as if you were bowing your window, and now you would see things distorted. That distortion allows the focus for near vision. It is interesting to see that ciliary muscle do not have sympathetic innervation. Ciliary muscle are solely under control of parasympathetic. It now means, in turn, that only parasympathetic drugs can affect focusing. So, essentially, if I see a change in pupil size with a change in focusing, with a change in accommodation, with blurry vision, I know it's a muscarinic drug. Whereas if I see a change in pupil size with no effect on accommodation, it must be an alpha-1 drug. Just choose the right one. Did I see a meiosis or midriasis? But check well. Is there a change in focusing to know that then it's a muscarinic drug? Let's try. Imagine I tell you I have a drug that causes dilated pupil and prevents you from focusing for near vision. So you want to read a piece of paper? It's all blurry. What is it? An alpha-1 agonist, an alpha-1 blocker, a muscarinic agonist, or a muscarinic blocker? First, I said midriasis. So dilated pupil, it's either alpha-1 agonist to stimulate radial muscle or muscarinic antagonist to allow the radial muscle to be predominant. Fine. Now I also said, I can't focus. If I can't focus, I must be a muscarinic drug. And a muscarinic drug that dilates pupil must be a muscarinic antagonist. By the way, to paralyze accommodation, that's what we call cycloplegia. Plegia, paralysis, cyclops of the eye. So muscarinic antagonist, blurred vision, dilated pupil. Muscarinic agonist would cause pinpoint pupil and spasm of accommodation. So everything that's close by would be very clear, but things in the distance would be blurry. Alpha-1 drug, whether agonist with midriasis or blockers with meiosis, have no effect on accommodation.